today, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Patrick Solden uh, from University of North Carolina and Karolinska Institute uh, to our seminar series. And if you are listening carefully over the last few minutes, you may have learned that Patrick uh, did his training here in New Zealand. So uh, he's now a distinguished professor uh, in uh, genetics and psychiatry at uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill uh, and also a professor at the Karolinska, Inst Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Um, MD training from the University of California, San Francisco, psychiatric training at University of Pittsburgh, and right here in the Department of Psychological Medicine, well, not right here, but close enough, in Christchurch School of Medicine, um, and was training funded, fellow funded by the Health Research Council of New Zealand. Um, and he is, But he's here today um, to talk to us about uh, a topic that has two words that I had to look up as a statistician. Um, so lessons from conservation biology and human genetics from zoonomia. I said to look up Eutherian as well. So I'm going to hand over to uh, to Patrick and hopefully he's going to explain to me as a statistician what those things are. Cheers, Nick. Thank you so much for the, for the, the kind introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, me, so this is about zoonomia and there's some stuff here about conservation biology, human genetics and a bunch of other things. Um, I'm a consultant shareholder of Numora Therapeutics. Just it doesn't really have any relevance to this, but I err on the side of overcalling. Um, and it's not going forward, there we go. So this, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today was my pandemic baby. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a human complex trait geneticist. I, I co-founded and lead some of the big consortia in my field, the global consortia. Um, but I'm also a long-term data scientist and I've done a lot of most um, stuff in the past. Um, I've known Shirsten Lynn Bladeau and Elnor Carlson for years. And as I mentioned there, I can be kind of um, persistent. And they very kindly allowed me to work on a new multi-species alignment in regard to its importance for human genetics. So I took a staycation sabbatical um, late 2020 through 2021, and I basically did nothing else but this for about a year and a half. Um, the, there's a packet of papers coming out in science next month um, they're all listed there. The first two are the ones that I'm going to talk about. Um, I contributed some of the work to the to flagship one, and I did uh, I, I led flagship two. Um, these papers are in bioarchive. I'll, I'll post the links for people to grab in case they're if they're interested. Zoonomia, um, they had a Nature cover in uh, November 2020. Um, really, there were two papers in here. The first was sort of the the rationale behind Zoonomia itself, um, what its point was, how they selected things, what the basic ideas were. Um, in addition, um, to enable it, um, one of their clever um, uh, data science uh, uh, evolutionary genetics people came up with a brand new improvement, a marked improvement on a, on a particular aligning strategy, how you actually deal with all these genomes that basically managed to, to really put it up to, to the next level. Um, it can handle tens of thousands of, of genomes, which is really gonna be critical for what's coming. Um, for, this is the, the tree and eutherian mammals are approximately similar as placental mammals. Not 100% similar, but, but good enough for government work. Um, the 240 species are listed in the circle there. Um, they go back to a common ancestor 104, 105 million years ago. And as you can see, if you start in the center, you branch out and then things split and split and split, eventually to the point where you get the, the, the mammals that are extant upon Earth today. So to select these, they wanted to do a, a balanced selection across all of the Eutherian tree. Um, they wanted to include more than one or more species from every family, every, every sort of classification family. Um, within that, um, there were ones that were of medical interest, biological interest, biodiversity or conservation interest. They tended to come forward um, and they managed to really sort of get a more complete look at placental mammals than ever before. So in the end, they pulled together genome sequences from 240 Eutherian mammals. Um, 110 were pre-existing and they added 130 new sequences, including 43 primates. Um, the DNA was asked, they, they got the DNA samples from all over the place. Um, and despite the fact they only wanted a couple milli micrograms, they actually only got, um, there were 36 uh, species where they actually could not get a good enough DNA sample. It gives you an idea that some of these are very, very difficult to find, difficult to sample, 
or are, are extremely threatened. Um, but the, the cool thing here is that the branch length was calculated to be something like 16.6 substitutions per site. With that, you would expect by chance 191 positions in the genome to be um, identical in all 240 species by chance. In fact, we observe um, over 3 million. You know, so clearly this is actually getting at something that's way beyond chance expectations. And many of us are familiar with the work of Nomad or TopMed or any of the large human catalogs. And they have a branch length of only zero under of less than one because humans are of course a relatively related species. And so billions of different positions are gonna be identical across, across all those humans just by chance. So it's nowhere near saturation. Whereas um, in fact, Zoonomia actually gets a base pair level conservation or constraint. Um, just for grins, um, the, screening, the screaming hairy uh, armadillo is in this alignment and that has to be a great name for a punk band. Um, I won't go into too much details about what progressive cactus is, but that is the software that made this happen. Um, what it do, does, is it, it takes all the observed, effectively what it does, it takes all the observed sequences and puts them together to try and find the, the, the really remote distal ancestor to make it up effectively, to, to, to infer it, impute it from the existing um, 240 genomes in the current time. Um, uh, and as part of the, the, the paper, they actually threw in a bunch of um, non-Eutherian vertebrate genomes and they aligned 600 of them, which was the most that I think has been done to date. Um, I'll skip the process. The, so once you do this, you measure constraint. And as, as with many things in the stat gen business, it's, it's an observed to the expected. The observed is relatively straightforward. Um, you look at the alignment, how many species have the same base at that position. Um, the expectation, as is often the case, is really difficult. Um, what they do is they basically, they identify several hundred thousand um, repeat regions that were present in, the, in these genomes way back at the start. And then they look at how they change under neutral drift over time. So the, the expectation is averaged across many, many different genomic regions that are found in all of these different species to look at what the mutation rates are. And that comes up with the expected. Um, and as it turns out, when we did this, um, there's, a, there's a metric called the Philo P score. Um, and we determined that 2.27, things equal to or, or greater than that, um, got us to the point of an FDR of 0.05. This ended up being 100,651 and 370 bases, that zero got chopped off there, so 100.6 megabases, which is about 3.53% of the genome we declared as being highly conserved. And um, this alignment actually does achieve base pair resolution. To look at the top one here, um, this is looking at 32.127 million, 32 million bases that are in coding sequence, comprising 10.71 million codons. What you see here on the top are 64 lines. Each line at, shows the median constraint of all of the 64 codons um, that are actually found um, in the protein coding regions of the human genome. Um, so what you see here is the, the first position, codon position one, is, is highly, the, the 2.27 line is this one right here. The, the, as you can see, the first position is highly conserved for almost all. The second position is in general even more concerned. And the third position is, is fairly, has a very low level of constraint with a couple of exceptions. Um, this is um, tryptophan, this is methionine. Um, these are conserved basically because they're the only two where you have a single codon coding for this amino acid. And, and this, of course, reflects the, the fourfold degenerate site and the third codon position. Going a little deeper to this, this is if, if you look at methionines in the start position, which should be highly conserved versus not, you see the same pattern. You see greater range, but lesser absolute values. Um, cysteine, which forms disulfide bridges. Um, if, if a cysteine was in a known disulfide bridge, it was far more constrained than any other cysteine there. And then we showed this is the uh, constraint pattern for the eight amino acids where it, the, the third position doesn't matter, it's degenerate. 
um, for example, you get alanine that's declared by the first two codon position one and two, and the third can be anything, and you still get the same amino acid degenerate psych. And as you can see, the constraint levels are quite low. In addition, it actually scales up further. So this is an analysis where we looked at the constraint level over all 100,000 base pair bins in the genome. Um, we would expect 33.5%, um, 3.53% of that to be um, uh, under constraint on average, and that's what we find. However, we also find a very long right tail. We worked out a test statistic for this, and we basically said, okay, what are the 100,000 regions which are far more constrained than you would expect by chance? Um, and we immediately find the HOX-D, HOX-A, HOX-B, and HOX-C clusters. These are four clusters of, of HOX genes which are known to be exceptionally conserved because they, they code for the development of many, many different important things about the structure of a mammal. For example, how the digits are formed. There's a very precise sequence of, of Hox genes that, that come on, go off, and then come on, go off, et cetera. And so that these are highly constrained is, is a nice uh, confirmation that this is working in the right shape. Okay, now I'm gonna walk through some of the highlights of the flagship one paper. This was meant to be more of an, of an EVO um, paper, more than something that's related to human disease. So first of all, there were, there were 3.6 million bases that were perfectly constrained across all species. The null expectation was 191. Obviously, it's vastly, vastly higher than that. Um, the common ancestor that they mapped everybody, uh, mapped all these species back to had 20 chromosomes, including sex chromosomes. And interestingly, um, about half of the human genome exists in centenny block that are more than a megabase in size. A syntenic block is one where the, the gene content and the gene order is actually quite preserved. It can flip around to different chromosomes uh, and then be in different places, but you actually have the same cassette of genes that are actually, that are staying together. Generally, this is because they do something that may be quite similar. So for example, the Hox cluster, one of the Hox, Hox A cluster, I think was the one had the greatest size. It was about in a 20 megabase block that was inherited together. This is also one of the reasons why we can make mouse models of large pathogenic copy number variants because of, of these syntenic blocks. So for example, 22Q11 deletion in human exists on chromosome 16 in mouse, I believe, but it's basically the same genes in the same order. Therefore, you can engineer the mouse knockout and you can have it be something that's quite um, believable as a human analog. Um, there's an interesting bit about mammalian evolution. The question was first, um, in, the, in the dinosaur killer asteroid strike 65 million years ago at the KPG boundary, um, huge extinction event that, led, that, that basically enabled mammals to spread. The question was, did mammalian diversity start at that point at the KT boundary and then spread that way? Or did it exist before the asteroid strike? And the asteroid strike basically allowed mammals to flourish. And the data in the study is, is familiar with the, the latter idea. And this is something that has been hotly debated, but the data from Zoonomi is, 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 is helping to um, put a, a weight on one side of the scale. Interestingly, elephants have the most olfact functional olfaction genes um, uh, over 1700, whereas orca and various whales have um, a very few, a couple dozen at most. And then finally, if you're clever about it, you can actually look at, um, you can use these species to contrast a species with a feature of interest to a close cousin that does not have that feature of interest. For instance, you can look at echolocation, bats, dolphins versus the, the species neighboring to them. And if you do that, you find that the, 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 the genetic regions that change are ones that have a lot to do with the formation of the ear, the acoustic sensitivity, et cetera. Um, one of the ones that's super important is hibernation. Um, NASA has been paying attention to this for obvious reasons, because if we could learn how to have humans hibernate, that would be great for space travel. It'd probably be really good for a whole bunch of um, human health conditions as well. And they found there's a stack of genes which um, um, basically appear to have something to do with why some species can hibernate and others cannot. 
In addition, there's some nice work on brain size. And in fact, a number of the things which, um, which are, relate to brain size within mammalian, within placental mammals, actually have to do with a bunch of macrocephaly genes that in human, Mendelians that cause macrocephaly. Um, for conservation biology, this is a, a big thing. And, and basically they came up with a comparative metric of threat. So you can look at the genome sequence and come up with some ideas as to the degree of threat for species extinction that that species might be um, uh, predisposed to. Um, in terms of flagship two, which, the, which was the human disease one, um, I gotta tell you, it's a big paper. Um, we wrote it such that the supplement has a series of 12 essays. And those essays basically have the whole analysis, what we did, why we did it, all the steps, all the decisions. And then we essentially abstracted a paragraph and a figure to go actually in the main manuscript. Um, the reason why was this was easily the most ambitious paper I think I've ever been involved with. And um, you know, there's no other way to write it except that. So if you want the gory details, look at the supplement. Um, the context here is this. Um, by my count, there's on the order of 200,000 associations of some variant with a human disease. The question, of course, is what the hell do they do? Um, this central problem in, bi in biology, this annotation gap, motivated the recent NHGRI, uh, the National, uh, NH, National Human Genome Research Institute um, set of grants um, called IGVF. The goal of IGVF, it's essentially ENCODE version four, is to annotate all the, is to annotate the human genome. So there's huge EMPRA studies happening. There's huge, um, you know, variant modification studies happening, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all happening in a public coordinated way. I recommend people watch this space. It should be super interesting a few years from now. Um, so for example, if, if you one were to do exome sequencing in humans, um, the most frequent variant you see is one that is observed in exactly one person by far. Um, and the question, of course, is how do you determine which of those are potentially impactful, which are just random stuff, which are ones that you actually have to be pay attention to because they might actually be involved with your phenotype. For whole exome sequencing, you know, people talk about putative loss of function variants, putative protein truncating variants, nonsense variants, um, much less, of course, there are tons and tons of missense variants, which of these are important. In fact, there's certainly examples of synonymous variants, which make a difference. How do we actually separate the vast majority of wheat chaff from the kernels of wheat that we really need to look at? And a lot of this relies on a variety of algorithms, as you certainly know. And to my knowledge, at least to date, none of those have actually been uh, subjected to really, really high throughput verification studies. Maybe it's ongoing. I hope it is. But if it is, I haven't seen it. So the idea behind here is basically this. Every base in, in, in the human genome that aligns in Zenomia had 16 chances to change over the last 105 million years. If that base is the same, it, that's telling us something. There's information in that. That constraint tells us that there's something about that nucleus that base pair, the nucleotide, where it is, um, that is important in some region. So the constraint essentially means that um, this genomic position has changed less than you would have expected under a neutral drift model. The observed is far different from the expected. Um, and the expected is that difference is being driven by purifying selection. In other words, the change happens, something bad happens, and uh, fitness changes at, for the worst for it. And the cool thing about this is that it's completely agnostic to mechanism. High constraint just, and we infer that high constraint impacts some biological process in some cell at some developmental stage. Um, and the idea here is can we use this to help close the annotation gap? Um, in, in the supplement, because people always ask us about this, is, a, is where we compare and contrast the evolutionary approach we took to catalogs of variation in human, um, um, in, in human uh, subjects. The, the real difference here, I think, is there's some potential advantages each way. The key advantage of Zoonomia is, a, is its agnosticism and the fact that it has base pair resolution. Um, and, and whereas a lot of, you know, uh, whereas currently 
it's going to take one or two extra zeros added to the number of people that are in these catalogs to even get to a point that's similar. So it, it's a good reasonable thing to do. Um, the other thing that, that's interesting is that um, a lot of the, we have a chance be, over evolution, um, these forces have occurred in all sexes, in both sexes. They've occurred in multiple different environmental contexts and they've occurred many times. Whereas often for humans, we're looking at one variant in one sex in one environmental condition. And that of course is, is potentially a problem if there's if it's more if it's more complicated than a simple single gene, single variant phenotype type connection. Um, the first thing I did was I tried to develop a gene-based measure of constraint. In other words, how can we rank genes? Um, I, I developed um, a bunch of different things to do. And in the end, the simplest was the one that won. Um, I even included this, this huge model where I um, asked for a terabyte of, um, of, of storage and of, of memory and a week's worth of compute type and let this huge model run where I included everything I could think of to try and actually fit to understand the, the sources of variance for this, this conservation file of P-score and then analyze the residuals that did not do as well. N none of the ways that I actually did this did as well as something that was very simple. For each gene, you take the, you take the number of coding bases that are under constraint and you divide it by the total number of bases, that's it. So it's the fraction of the CDS that's under constraint. And um, to visualize, I, I made this graph. Um, the input here was um, were, were all um, 19,980 human protein coding genes. Um, I added a couple of QC variables about whether the, the phylo P scores were missing, whether a few species aligned, um, high mammalian constraint, high primate constraint was also included. And then I used UMAP to basically do the two-dimensional uh, reduction of the multivariate scape. Um, there were a, an outlier group, two outlier groups for different reasons, which actually we can't because of the nature of those genomic regions. It's too junky to really call. Um, those are A and B. C are genes like all the MHC genes ended up here. These effectively are genes whose job it is to innovate, whose job it is to mutate. And then um, there were there were like 15 genes here, which were exceptionally highly conserved, constrained, sorry. And then E was everything else. And here what you see in this embryo-shaped um, UMAP plot, which my colleagues liked, um, was it, it's, it's basically shaded by the degree of conservation. So as you can see, it goes anti-clockwise from poor con con conservation con constraint around noon all the way to exceptionally high. I did a gene set analysis which I think was informative, where I did a gene set analysis of the top 5% most constrained genes and the bottom 5%. The top 5% were basic embryology, the morphogenesis of every organ system, whole bunch of cell cycle stuff and synapse. These are the genes that tend to make a mammal. If you mess with these, bad things happen and fitness declines sharply. So if, if you actually alter something about, you know, some component of the synapse, it's really, it's generally not a good thing to do. Um, on the other hand, in, in the least constrained genes, the bottom 5%, um, these were genes that had a lot to do with defense responses, um, bitter taste and smell, in development and characterization, literally at the interface of the mammal and its environment. And all of these genes is, are things that have to do with how a mammal fits into its niche. This is important, I think, for a human geneticist because you have to ask yourself, is your gene, what type, of, what type of biological process do you think underlies your gene? I look at schizophrenia, so it's the top 5%. Other people might be looking at uh, you know, a sensory organ problem or an immune disease, for example, or a skin disease, and they're definitely on the other um, aspect. In the bottom. Um, we showed, just to walk through a couple of highlights of our paper, we compared ClinVer from 2016 to 2019. And if you look at um, the status in 2016 and the status of 2019, the benigns that stayed benign in both had relatively low conservation scores. 
pathogenic, that stayed pathogenic had really high constraint scores. Uncertain to benign had low scores. Uncertain in 2016 to pathogenic had really high scores. So this gives us some idea that the base pair resolution actually helps us perhaps to actually do some things in, in the ClinVar space. Um, there's a huge section in the paper um, that's really complete, really done, done super thoughtfully by my uh, friend and colleague, Stephen Gazal, where he, he applied um, stratified LD score regression to a battery of 63 large GWAS and made these following conclusions. That first, mammalian constraint scores have close to base pair resolution in helping understand human GWAS. Second, um, they're uniquely informative compared to all known functional app annotations and prior constraint annotations that have been used. So they really add some newness and, and some new juice to this whole process. Um, and they're yet more informative when you actually combine them with primate scores. So working on the mammalian and the primate together are actually quite useful. Um, we also showed that it's, they're helpful in trying to annotate copy number variants in two ways. Um, first, um, they're great for quality control. Um, you get copy number, very copy, number, copy number variant calls with chips for a lot of regions, which are actually junky. They, they don't have many coding axons. They've got very few or little um, no regulatory elements, and um, they're not constrained in the slightest. Those are things that you can probably remove. And what, what we did was um, with Jin Sakiwas, for example, we looked at deletions and comparing, this is schizophrenia, we compared cases to controls for the, the number of constrained bases that were removed by deletion, that were affected by deletion. And as you can see, the case control difference was far greater, a p-value of 10 to the 19th versus 10 to the 14th. So it was five logs um, more significant. So we're, we're working, we're using this now as a way to help clean and analyze copy number variants. Um, the, the, and next is polygenic risk scores. I suspect I will not need to describe that to this group. Um, the basic idea, by the way, came from Peter Vischer, Naomi Ray in Brisbane, um, but soon heading to Oxford um, in the International Schizophrenia Consortium paper in, in, in 2020. The idea comes from cows, of all things, from some of their work in livestock. The basic idea is you get GWAS results for a trait from a separate sample. You select approximately 100,000 LD independent SNPs um, with the same with some association signal, some degree of association signal. You intersect that with a separate subject genotype data frame. And you then look at the weighted sum of the logistic regression betas from the training sample using the genotypes in the testing sample. And that summation comes down to the PRS. The typical approach is agnostic. It is just an algorithm and it doesn't actually pay attention to any functional annotations. Um, I pulled together three separate groups in this, Yun Lee from UNC, Laura Hawkins from Yale, and Naomi from Brisbane, and they use slightly different methods. And the cool thing is conservation really helped. Constraint scores really helped. Doing, using evolutionary constraint scores, these SNPs carried at least 2x the information than the other ones. Um, and so this is something which I think we're working on in a real deep way, but I think this is actually a real can be really important in maximizing the information we get um, from uh, for polygenic risk score creation and utility in clinical samples. Okay, um, I, I wanna make sure we have enough time to talk. When I finish, I'll paste these two links um, in, the, in the chat. Um, these are the links on BioArchive to Flagship 1 and 2. They're not the current version. Flagship 2 is actually quite different. We had to do the initial submission version to BioArchive. But the, the full version, the new ones will be coming out next um, next month in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll post this link as well. This is to my Google Drive where you can actually get all the stuff that I talked about. Um, this folder actually contains the data frame per chromosome and per base. Um, this is an example of one um, chromosome, um, the bed format base position. This is HG38 and HG19. Um, the Philo P score for all mammals, fast cons in all mammals, fast cons in primates, and then the number of species that align. And so this is every alignable base that we have. Grab them, knock yourself out. It's 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 you know it's tricky. You have to think it through how to use it. But it's not too bad. There's a decent README. Um, this is the bed file that contains the coverage. 
the regions of the genome that we actually had calls on. Um, this gene matrix is something that I've made to help understand human genetics. It, there's one entry per gene. It also has the constraint scores that I mentioned if you want to use them. Um, and then these are the regions where we've taken the conserved regions um, in primates and then merged them down to a much, much smaller file. So these are essentially the bed file regions that are highly constrained. And this is those, so this is in primates for fast cons, and this is for all mammals. So if you were to grab this stuff, you could probably do a lot of, of things to see whether it makes sense given the problems you work on. Um, and I owe deep debt to Shirsten and Ellen Eleanor and Stephen for all the fun work. It was just absolutely fantastic to spend all the, uh, the crappy times in the pandemic working on something super interesting like this. And I have deep thanks to them for allowing that. And if we have time, um, I've heard word, words about the thing and I'd love to hear more about it. Um, we have some, there may be some possibilities for reasonable overlap. But thank you for your attention. I'm certainly happy to take any questions y'all might have. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, don't forget to come back in two weeks time and thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you. Bye. See you all.